Welcome to Liquid Margins. I'm very uh, proud to say this is our 26th Liquid Margins. Then we're going to, no, 25th. Sorry. Uh, I'm already thinking of the next one. Uh, but we're going strong with this. It's a great show. Um, and um, this particular one I'm very excited about. Um, it's empowering student writing with social annotation. Today's guests are Noelle Holton Brathwaite, and she's assistant professor of English at Farmingdale State College. Mary Traster, and I'm really sorry, but I forgot to ask how to pronounce your name, so I'm hopefully not bungling them. Uh, Mary good. Traster is, thank you, assistant professor teaching of writing at the University of Southern California. And Chris Curvina, she is associate professor of English at Northern Virginia Community College. And our moderator today is Jeremy Dean, and he's a VP of Education at Hypothesis. Thanks, Rennie. Uh, I am super excited uh, to be here this morning. Um, I have been working with Mary and Chris for several years now. Mary, I believe we met at the University of California, Irvine for end of workshop I did. You maybe helped organize that workshop. And Chris and I presented together um, at Iannotate several years back in Washington, D.C. So, and no, it's great to to connect with you. And I know that you're a longtime user of Hypothesis. So I'm super excited to be here with this group of folks. Um, I'm super excited because I'm a former writing teacher, uh, an English professor, and so it's great to be with my kindred spirits. Um, and there's one subtext to this. Uh, conversation I just want to draw people's attention to, which is there's a fantastic article that um, that Noel, uh, Mary, and Chris wrote about uh, social annotation from the journal Pedagogy. A lot of my questions are going to come out um, from reading that article and and their teaching and, and the research they did. Um, so I provided a link. Actually, I just didn't do it um, for any set. I just did it to the host and panelists. So let me post it in there for everybody. Um, so I'm excited to be here. I want to start off by allowing each of you guys to tell us a little bit more about your specific educational context, what type of schools you teach at, uh, what type of courses you use hypothesis in, if there's any particular uh, demographic uh, specificity uh, to your students. Um, so let's let's start there and maybe we can begin with you, Noel. Um, yes, good, good morning or good afternoon to, for some of us. Um, I, I teach at Farmingdale State. College, which is uh, part of the SUNY Pantheon uh, of schools, State University of New York. We are located in Long Island, right in the middle of Long Island, actually. And I use hypothesis, oh, thus far I've used hypothesis solely with my uh, first year composition students. This semester, I'm actually going to use it again with my first year students but I'm also going to use it in a, a journalism feature writing class that I'm teaching and I'm, and I'm very excited about that. Um, yes. Chris, you wanna go next? Sure, uh, I'm Chris Carvina. I teach at Northern Virginia Community College, which is one of the largest community colleges in the United States. We have six campuses. Um, I always kind of have to count on my fingers to remember uh, how many we have. I teach at, uh, at Manassas, which is the smallest of our, our kind of main campuses. Our medical education campus is actually smaller, but they're a lot more specialized. Um, I have used hypothesis with uh, my second semester composition courses. I haven't taught that course in a little while. Um, it has been I do need more, more, more fingers to count the campuses. <laughs> uh, it has been a couple of years since I've used hypothesis with those students uh, because I haven't taught it since, since the pandemic started. Um, and I'm looking forward to using it again. I understand our community college system is getting ready to do a pilot and I have put my hand up for pilot integration with Canvas, which is our learning management system. And, and once that integration starts, I'm definitely gonna be using that with all of my classes because I do teach the first and second year or second semester composition as well as an occasional literature class that's uh, that I think will be fantastic to use 
hypothesis with. Just a quick note, I think you did more than just raise your hand. I think you helped shove a uh, hypothesis into the conversation there. So thank you for that. We're looking forward to uh, getting the pilot off the ground. Mary? Hi, everyone. Um, yes, I teach at the University of Southern California, which is in Los Angeles. Um, it's a private four-year institution. Um, I generally teach with hypothesis in my first year composition courses, um, but I also teach an advanced um, second semester composition course, um, which is typically for our juniors and seniors. Um, so those are the two contexts that I've tried the tool out in. Um, I think in terms of demographics, USC is often um, ranked very high up there as far as a large international population. Um, so yeah, I think those are the those are the constraints I'm working with. Thanks so much. I, I think one of the really neat things about the three of you and, and the article that you wrote and the research you did, even though you're all teaching similar courses, you are in very different contexts with like a four-year private, four-year public, and a two-year public. So I think that's really interesting that, to, to see that diversity. Um, the article that you wrote for pedagogy sort of frames the problem for your students as the kind of in the echo chamber, you know, of reading on the, on the internet and not getting out of a bubble of information that may be misinformation. Um, I'm wondering what other challenges you and your students face uh, or face that led you to adopt a tool like Hypothesis? What were you feeling? What were you seeing? What were you feeling? What were the pain points you guys were experiencing that said, I need something that's going to help us read uh, better and read uh, together? Um, maybe we can reverse this time and, and start with you, Mary. Um, such a good question. Yeah, I think um, for my student population, what I was finding when I first joined the faculty here was that my students would arrive at the university believing that they were already expert readers. Um, and I think what I was finding as I was evaluating their writing was that they were tending to use more basic strategies of interpretation. Um, so I'd see a lot of information dumping and a lot of quoting from other authors as though it reinforced my students' own points, um, where what we really want to do in our courses is stress critical reasoning and critical thinking and um, taking an original viewpoint and adding something to the discussion. Um, so hypothesis, I think, what it, what it helped me to do was really develop a pedagogy that would be organized around recentering reading in the classroom and thinking of it as a kind of sequential process that they could, um, you know, practice different skills varying from simpler to more complex, um, but really trying to help them think about um, what are other strategies available to you other than quoting and directly um, summarizing and paraphrasing. Um, so I think, I think that's where I kind of started with it and how I implemented it. Chris, you want to pick up there? Yeah, and I think that I have used critical annotation in um, in a number of of contexts, even before hypothesis. Uh, I started out as a high school teacher, and in those contexts, um, I started using a tool, a web tool called Comment, years and years ago, which was a web annotation tool. Um, and I've also done it where I have printed out text, blown it up, put it on big paper. There's the high school teacher in me. I'm, I'm the, the office supply queen. Um, big paper and said, let's write on this together and think it through together. For, for me, it has been a situation where I think that students often feel like they're the only one who is having some issues with understanding what's going on and they are a little afraid to question or to speculate, but once it becomes a more social activity, they seem to be more inclined to, um, to take a little bit more of a risk in their, in their reading and to, and to be a little bit more open. I love that so much. I really wanna come back to, to your points there, Chris. Uh, Noel, what were some of the challenges that you were facing uh, with students that led you to uh, hypothesis and social annotation? Well, interestingly enough, my own 
background uh, was a huge motivating factor when I learned about social annotation because I am a former journalist and I noticed in my own writing that when I, when I collected information, I, I interviewed sources um, and I sat down to write, there was a huge difference in the ease of writing and the quality of writing that I was able to produce when I, I, simply, I simply followed those steps without having conversations with other reporters, with editors, without engaging with, with copy editors even. Um, and I, re I realized my, my writing was so much richer when I was able to talk through um, the, the information and sort of um, really develop a, a perspective about what it was I was writing about. And I realized that those conversations were key and crucial. So when I landed in the writing classroom, I would say things like writing is, is a social uh, activity um, and, and it's a myth that the writer just uh, operates in isolation. But there's a, there's a difference between being able to say that and being able to, to show it. And even though I would do group work in the writing classroom, um, I felt that social annotation was a tool to take it, take it back uh, several steps and allow students to realize that, that reading was key, but, but thinking and having conversations about what one is reading is I think really what pushes one forward in the writing process. And specifically for my campus, we have a largely commuter campus. Um, I would say probably 90% of our student body commutes to campus. And most of our students have jobs and lots of responsibilities outside of campus. And it's very, very difficult for them to make connections in, in often um, right when they're right there physically on campus. So annotation gives them another opportunity to engage and to see what their classmates are thinking um, and to, to, to see asynchronously what's going on. And then I found that it really fueled our conversations in the classroom when, when they could look and see, oh yes, I had, the, I had that same thought or I had some of those similar questions as I was reading. That's great, thanks. Uh, your, your answers to that question really are encompassed in the subtitle to your article uh, digital annotation is critical community to promote active reading, right? I think Mary sort of talked about active reading and different form, you know, strategies for active reading. And then we sort of slowly move towards the social as we, as we heard you guys respond. And I want to dive deep into both of those. Um, but I want to pull back the curtain a bit because I believe it was in conversation with you, Mary, many years ago, probably at the genesis of this article, when you were talking to me about, uh, and I think you were quoting Robert Scholz at the time or something like that, that the, that reading is invisible um, in, when we teach often, that we don't, there's no visibility around reading. And over the time, I think that that idea actually creeped into our own marketing at Hypothesis. It's one of the things that we uh, say every time we are, you know, talking about Hypothesis with instructors is that Hypothesis makes reading visible. And I want, I was wondering if each of you could help me unpack that idea. How does social annotation make reading visible and why is that important? And Mary, since I think you're the genesis of that marketing slogan, um, maybe you should start. <laughs> what does it mean to make reading visible? Amazing. Um, yes, I remember, I think that that article had such an enormous impact on us as instructors, um, just because I think in the context of that article, school was, schools was talking about, you know, we don't teach reading and we don't see reading. And if we could see how our students were reading, I think we would be horrified, I think is the word that he used. Um, so I think, I think what hypothesis allows us to do is actually assign reading, center it um, in the classroom. I think it allows us to see how students are reacting to the text um, when they highlight 
a passage and make a comment on it, we can actually see what kind of operation they're doing in that moment. Are they summarizing? Are they remembering something else that they knew um, from another class or from their own experience? Um, we can see if they're judging the material or evaluating it. Um, we can see if they're doing some analysis or detecting bias. Um, so I think, I think this idea that we can see reading is really about being able to understand a student's interaction with the text. Um, and I think, I think the other piece is just giving that, that spatial awareness of where students are on the page. So there's something about that visibility of reading that's also coming through in the, the highlighting itself. Um, so a student maybe marks up the page and it's becoming visible to them as well as to us. Um, yeah, um, I just want to pause there because one of my favorite things about the article is the way you guys talk about that physicality of reading at the beginning and the move from paper um, to digital and how in, in the paper world, the material world, we have more of a physical sense of our books and things like that, right? I can pull something off the shelf and somehow I have a sense of like it's about three quarters of the way through Gatsby, the passage I'm looking for. Um, but we really lose that physicality online. And you guys have some beautiful language in the article where you're describing just that physicality. The page paves the way to one's personal reflection in the same way that a front path leads to one's home. And then you talk about how annotation is a way of kind of forging a more physical path in that sort of, you know, ethereal digital world. But back to the visibility piece. Um, Chris, what are your thoughts on what it means to make reading uh, visible and how social annotation can make reading visible? The way I've always kind of thought about social annotation is having conversations about a text on a text. So really grounding those discussions in textual moments as, as students respond to the text. And uh, I always encourage them to respond to one another as well. Um, that was something that I felt very strongly about so that they could make those connections with one another and with their own experiences and on the text itself. Uh, I often find that when students will read something, they will make those connections, but not be aware of those connections. So those, those moments where they can trace that out um, are valuable to them. I think we all overestimate what we're going to remember or what the significance was, but interrupting, in some ways interrupting the reading to take those moments of reflection can be valuable as well. So I think that for me is, is, is the conversations about the text on the text is, is key. I love that. Noel, anything to add on visibility and reading? Um, nothing really to add, but just to um, echo what, what Chris said, I, I, I hadn't actually thought of it that way, but that I realized that's exactly what's happening. We're sort of leaving markers for ourselves, breadcrumbs for ourselves and for one another, uh, so we can kind of go back and, and trace our thinking about the text. And I know that that is so valuable uh, to us in academic writing um, and in professional uh, communication, professional writing. And that's something that we're able to model for students early on in our, in our first year composition classes. Um, and even in our upper level classes, really, it, it really gives them a concrete example of, of the importance of, of doing that. Because if you don't leave those little clues for yourself, exactly as Chris said, you think you're gonna remember, you think you're gonna, you think you're gonna have that same insight again, but as we all know, that may or may not happen. So, yes. So sticking with you, Noel, can you tell us how you introduce this tool and prompt your students? You could, anything from giving us an example of assignment or explain why you're making them do this additional thing. Um, how do you present this to students when you, when you, when you first introduce it in the course? That's an excellent question. Well, like Chris, I have a long history of encouraging 
annotation um, in print in, in, previous, um, in, in previous courses that I've taught before, I adopted digital annotation. And I always introduce annotation in, in general as something that is going to be able to in, enhance students' understanding of text, but also their ability to write about texts. Um, there's so much anxiety among students about uh, writing and they, they tend to, um, as, as Mary was saying, see reading is almost the invisible link. They don't, they don't really make the connection and all the anxiety is, is about this, this product that's going to get judged and critiqued. Um, and so I, I, I've always stressed how important annotation is in terms of um, that, that end goal that they're so concerned about, um, that without really digging apart and learning how to, how to, to, to dig texts apart and understand one's own thinking about the text that they're engaging with, that, that, that writing, all forms of writing, but particular academic writing gets to be that much more difficult. So I try to introduce it as something, a tool that's gonna to be very helpful to them and that will lower their anxiety levels once it's something that becomes um, a part of their discipline, a part of their writing routine. Uh, so in terms of introducing hypothesis and in terms of introducing digital annotation, it, the, our students are digital natives um, at this stage in history, and and um, they they take very quickly to the tool. Uh, it's such an easy tool to use, but I, I I spend more time up front, sort of giving them examples of um, an annotation that I've done. I usually model my own annotation and and talk through the process with them and how it started with looking at various texts and how it ended up with uh, my ability to be able to make connections between texts. That's, that's something that they, they can concretely see, oh, okay, this is exactly how this is going to help me when I have a writing assignment. Um, yes. Great, Chris? Yeah, I was gonna say, I, I asked, also have brought in examples um, of annotation and, and annotation failures. Honestly, I have a book from grad school that I took a picture of and have commented and will throw up a slide to talk about the death of the pink highlighter because I highlighted everything. And so what's important? I have no idea. But when I go back to some of the texts where I started to write notes, started to write comments, I can still trace some of my thinking, you know, a couple decades later, at least at that point in time. Um, and, I, and I mentioned to them that, and I will show them some of my textbooks, where if I've taught something more than once, I'll see different colors of annotation because I grabbed whatever pen was handy and added notes to my own notes. So I do that uh, to show them that even now my annotation and note-taking strategies are evolving and theirs will too. Um, I introduce it with some specific tasks for them to follow and, and mention that those aren't the only possibilities with annotation, but those are the things I want to make the connections to what we're studying at the time. What are some of those specific tasks, Chris, that you're suggesting might be part of what an annotation is? Um, for the assignments that I used uh, for the study, we were looking at appeals. We were looking at, you know, the classic ethos, pathos logos to see if they could find those things. Um, some of them were, some of those assignments were what, what's difficult, what's hard, right? So making a note of what it is they think is going on. I even will encourage them to define words if they don't know a word, 
but I also encourage them not to make that their sole way of interacting with a text. But I, because I do find that sometimes students will hit a word they don't know, maybe get a context clue that they think they know what it is, but there's, there's, a, there's a missing link there for them. And I think for, for students who want the right answer, that definition and social annotation, if they can be the first one to define that, that gives them a, a foothold in the text that they might have not taken if it was not offered to them. Thanks. So Mary, I'm gonna tack on to the end of the question of you know, how you introduce this to students. What are some of the specific things you want them to be doing or prompt them to do in those annotations? Such a good question. And I think, yeah, while Noelle and Chris, you were talking, I was just thinking about, you know, the way that my practice has evolved over time and the way that I implement the tool in my classroom has changed. Um, I think in the, the original moment, I was thinking, you know, about these challenges that we confront with the decline in critical reasoning, with manipulation by fake news, with, you know, we see this lack of critical summary in the papers that our students are writing. Um, and I think one of the biggest realizations that came out of studying student writing with this tool for me was just the fact that I was really focused on cognitive goals um, accordingly. I was really interested in helping students do more complex things with their thinking. Um, so moving away from those basic understanding and um, you know initial kind of moves of reading and really getting into analysis, evaluation, and comparison to other things they may have read before. Um, but I think what I found when I started doing, when I was doing modeling and when I was asking students to produce certain kinds of annotations, I felt like what was showing up in the margins and in, you know, in their hypothesis comments was that they were writing to me as their instructor rather than to one another as a community. Um, and to me, that was disrupting that environment where they were testing out beliefs and ideas and bringing their own personality and reaction to the text into the that initial encounter um, with new ideas. Um, so I, I think what's changed for me about the way I teach and implement the tool is that I've really tried to pull back from giving any specific instructions about what to do with the annotations. Um, and I do much more of that offline. So I'll assign, you know, fact idea list or evidence and commentary list where students are encouraged to practice some of the specific skills about, yeah, define this term or come up with a, you know, an assessment of whether this is a biased piece of information. Um, but when I put them in the online environment and using hypothesis, I've asked, I've actually stopped giving any instructions um, just to kind of see if that produces uses that more free form um, ability to add multiple voices into the discussion. Um, so it's been an interesting evolution, but I think, you know, listening to the way you're talking about modeling and showing how you actually use them in the writing, I, I think I would like to bring that in more to my, to my practice as well. Super interesting. Um, one of, I was rereading the article last night uh, from Pedagogy and I, I sort of had a revelation I think when I talk about social annotation I, and the benefits of it, I'll often say it helps learn to read, right? It helps teach active reading and, and critical reading practices. And it's also good for social engagement. And those are actually different things, right? Like if you want your students to be reading more deeply and critically, this is a great tool. If you want your students to build community, it's a great tool. But those aren't necessarily one and the same. But when I was reading your article, and it's in the title of the article, right, this idea of critical community, I started to think about how critical the social piece of social annotation is for the reading piece of, uh, of, um, of social annotation. So I was wondering if you guys could riff on that idea of just like, what is important about the social piece of social reading? And how is it not just kind of like, a, oh, we're together, but the, that togetherness, those interactions actually help with fundamental academic and, and higher order academic skill development. Um, Chris, you were leaning forward and I keep going back and forward in a linear one. So let's start with you this time. <laughs> yeah, I, 
I think for me, in some respects, one of the benefits of being able to see the traces that other readers are leaving behind um, kind of normalizes that reading can be challenging. And sometimes to get through those challenges, recording them, asking questions, looking at how other people respond and go, oh, I, I didn't think about it that way. Do I agree with that? Is that a thing that, that I should take from this text? Um, and in some respects, I find that when students can do that electronically, they are a little less hesitant to make those kind of question themselves or question each other moves than if they're face-to-face -face in a class. Don't get me wrong, I love face-to-face -face classrooms. I have had them, like I said, with the, with the large newsprint annotate together that way, but they, at least in the, in the class where I was using this tool, and I've actually found that in, with other online tools, they are kind of more likely to go, oh, I didn't think of that, or eh, I'm not sure I agree with your interpretation in a way that perhaps they would not in more traditional classroom environments. So there's that social piece where they are, they're able to question the text and each other's interpretations of the text as well. Noel, I don't know if you're still there. Uh... But do you want to pick that up, the idea of what, why the social is so important in social reading and how it actually invests the reading part? Yes. Um, well, I, I think that the social is, is important in, in the learning overall. Um, and I think about a, a negative example of when my husband actually was in grad school and unbeknownst to him, the entire class was meeting um, in a very challenging course that he was taking. And all the grades were sort of determined um, by what the consensus was. It was a very theoretical class uh, that the students had come together and uh, he was the outlier. So, you know, uh, not to, not to, brag about my husband but he's he's a very very intelligent person but it didn't matter how hard he tried how many hours he poured in how he just was banging his head up against this brick wall because he was this this outlier who was not in on the conversation he he was not able to benefit from uh sort of the shared collective consciousness of his classmates so i i see that in a similar light with with reading my my students i i always have out of a class of about 24 25 they're usually uh some very intense readers who who come in with with some strong skills um but the majority of students are are um un, un unafraid um and unabashed reading haters that's what they tell me at the beginning i hate reading i hate reading i'm a terrible writer so um i i usually get met with a with a serious brick wall um and again i know that my students aren't going to have a lot of time to get together and 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 discuss the texts or discuss their approaches to different assignments but uh this is a way for them to as Chris said, see what um, almost the, the, first of all, see that, yes, we're all engaged in, in something that, that may not uh, be something that we find immediate joy in or something that's very challenging for us. Um, and there's, I think there's an esprit de corps that, that is developed in that sense, but also to see that there, there are, um, there are different ways to view things and then then sometimes their classmates will have very similar takes on things um and a consensus is is developed around certain ideas and and um 
certain certain difficulties that students have with with analysis, they'll they'll start to say, "I'm not I'm not alone. Um, I I am getting this. I am on on the right track with this." Or other people are having similar challenges. So I just think in terms of of learning um, and opening one's mind to 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 something new, the the social aspect, the um, the ability to break out of that 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 sort of bubble of isolation is is really really valuable. Let me reframe for you a little bit, Mary, because I feel like from reading the article, I got the sense that you were the most focused on like the Bloom's taxonomy stuff, right, and the, like the different things that students should be doing to be good, you know, better readers to improve to become more expert readers. I think you said. Um, does the social interact with that? I mean, so one thing we often get is like, I want to have a way for my student to read the essay and only I can see their annotations, right? And that will allow me to help drill in um, those different kind of Bloom's taxonomy type things, right? Um, but is the social important in kind of that development of those, you know, spectrum of reading skills and strategies? Such a good question. Um, yeah, I think I think the thing that I've learned by using digital annotation is that I was very focused on yeah those cognitive skills. So how can we build reasoning to do better work um, and to produce better insights and more knowledge? Um, and I think what I really did learn by watching how my students communicated, you know, was just remembering that reading has always been about relationship. Um, so I think that initial question is so interesting too. Like, do we do we separate reading from community? Um, and I was just thinking, you know, we've always read to be in dialogue with someone who's different from ourselves, or we've always read to escape maybe from relationships with people who are close to us. Um, to find to find something new and to connect. Um, so I think. I think what what using the tool actually taught me was that, you know, there is on the one hand specific interventions we can make and specific skills that I can make, you know, approachable and accessible to a wide range of readers so that they can find themselves to be expert readers. Um, and I think that's on the one hand, but then on the other hand, I think there is this question of you know, how do relationships change over time and how is the way we relate, we relate political? Um, so is there something about the multi-logic that we have now, this ability to hear many different voices rather than just having a dialogue between two people that could give us more of what we need now to confront the realities of our time? Do we need more voices and more perspectives to confront the rise of bias and the rise of echo chambers? Do we need more ways to hear new ideas? Um, so I think, I think that kind of piece, which is, you know, on the one hand about community, but it's also about feeling and engagement and emotion, um, the affective. Um, so that idea of really making a connection with the text as well as with one another, I do think that that's indissociable from expert reading. Um, and I think it, it manifests in many ways. Like I think um, Noelle and Chris, you're talking to you about that, that connection they make as sharing responsibility to understand a text and not looking at it as a kind of individual struggling to master something, but working as a team. Um, so I think all of those pieces have to be together. And I think the tool has kind of helped um, establish that multilogism as a pedagogical approach. Amazing. Uh, and also, I was going to try to shoehorn a question in, but we're running out of time. But you covered it because I wanted to ask about affective reading. And I think it's there. Um, I said on Twitter this morning that I'm furious with my colleagues for only giving us 45 minutes because I could go on all day with you guys talking about this stuff. And so maybe we need to have a sequel. Um, but we are creeping up on time. Um, I do think the affective reading piece of the article is one of the most interesting interventions that you guys make. And I, I would love to have a whole session on why is it important that the emotional responses and experiential responses to readings are one and this are, are connected to the cognitive and other pieces of, of how we read. But I will shut up and just say thank you so much uh, for this conversation. I hope we can continue it at some other time. And I'll hand it back to Pranny. 
Thank you again for coming to Liquid Margins, and we will see you next time. Take care, everyone.